I'm uh, the chair of the Rainbow Reed Foundation, and I'm welcoming you all here today. And I want to pay my respects to the elders, both past and present, of the Turbul and Yagara people, because they danced and sang and told their stories on this very spot. And we're going to continue this afternoon to tell stories. I want to also thank um, John Kotsis and QPAC for their wonderful gift of giving us this evening here at, um, at QPAC. And I want to introduce to you um, two of the most talented, young, <laughs> <laughs> they disputed that, but I say, yeah, from my point of view, young, um, artists, uh, artistic directors working in Australia today. Sam and, and Kate. Sam, of course, is, is um, strong, is well known to most people here as the uh, artistic director of QTC. And Kate is the artistic director of Black Swan <coughs> Theatre in Western Australia. Soon, of course, to become the head of NIDA. What a wonderful job, what a, an amazing job she's going to have in front of her, shape, helping to shape more young students, more actors for the future. So I will just slip into the back and say thank you very much and enjoy yourselves. And afterwards, ladies and gentlemen, please join us for a few drinks downstairs. Thank you. And thank you, Lynn. Can I also uh, acknowledge the Yagger and Turrbal peoples and pay my respects to their elders, past and present. Uh, as I mentioned, my name is Sam Strong. I'm the Artistic Director of the Queensland Theatre Company, and it's my great pleasure uh, to be here at QPAC. Thank you to QPAC as well, uh, and to be in conversation with Kate Cherry, as will emerge uh, in the course of this hopefully relatively free-flowing conversation. Uh, Kate and I have, have quite a lot in common, and our paths have, have intersected uh, quite a bit now in our careers. I think we've directed the same play at more than once, possibly possibly a few times. Uh, Kate and I have both been associate directors uh, at the Melbourne Theatre Company uh, and in a small piece of trivia uh, that some of you may or may not choose to tweet, uh, <laughs> I was taught Year 12 English by Kate's mother uh, <laughs> as well. But we'll come on, we'll come on to that and other, other interesting tweetable uh, pieces of trivia. But before we go uh, any further, I'd like to officially uh, introduce, introduce Kate uh, and embarrass her by reading her bio. Uh, but I think it's important to read her bio because Kate is, a, is one of those uh, polymaths, uh, if you like, where she's, a, of course, a director of theatre uh, and of opera, but also uh, a leader of companies uh, and a cultural leader and an arts leader within the community. So in recognition of the, that diversity of talent, I'm going to officially embarrass you, <laughs> then we'll talk, then we'll talk. But I, will, um, I would like to read Kate's bio just to set the scene. Uh, for, for our conversation. So Kate Cherry is an Australian cultural leader of national standing, a director of theatre and opera and an educator. Uh, as Lynn mentioned, she's currently, um, for a little bit longer, uh, the joint CEO and artistic director of Black Swan State Theatre Company in Perth, uh, where her first season was presented in 2009. And as Lynn mentioned, also in November, uh, in a very exciting appointment, Kate will move to Sydney uh, to take up the position of director and CEO of NIDA. Uh, Kate's work as a director has been seen throughout the country, uh, at major arts festivals and at every state theatre company, as well as around the world, including, at New including in New York, San Francisco and Los Angeles. Her work as a theatre director and an opera director has received numerous awards and nominations. She holds an MFA in directing from the University of California, a BA in creative writing from Bard College. Uh, she's a Drama League Fellow, a founding member of the Lincoln Centre Lab, a Gilgood Award recipient, and most, Im most impressively of all, in a very impressive list, uh, has been nominated as West Australian of the Year. <laughs> so, ladies Which and gentlemen, is please, amazing yeah. when you're from Melbourne. <laughs> it is. It is probably the first person from Melbourne to be nominated. So please join me in, in officially welcoming Kate Sherry. <laughs> uh, we'll have some time for questions uh, at the end as well, but uh, uh, we'll, we'll keep today uh, relatively informal. But Kate, take me back to the beginning I've always wanted to do this kind of fireside thing, and it's great that I get I get the opportunity to do it. But um, but uh, more seriously, how did you how did you find yourself in the career of a theatre director? How did you first gain an interest in the arts? I would like to say I was really courageous and came from a family of bankers or something, but it's the family business, and um, it started in the 1930s in Ballarat, 
where mm. my um, grandfather had a, an, a scenic artist company and uh, all my aunts and uncles who weren't his children but were very talented designers, they all became designers and, and um, painted sets and when there weren't any sets to paint cathedrals, being good Catholic. <laughs> Yes, yeah. <laughs> and uh, my dad, who was my grandfather's only child, because um, a complicated series of, of uh, wives and husbands, etc. My father, who was his only child, was actually completely talentless with a paintbrush. And so all the older brothers and sisters would take him along with them while they went to work painting sets and, and creating sets. And he would sit in the theatre watching them make different lands and he would write stories and and think about how he would inhabit the the scenery and um, then he went to the University of Melbourne and became a, a director and ran Melbourne Theatre Company and by the age of 28 he'd um, kind of run out of things to do so eventually he became a director that worked um, internationally and so um, he had two daughters and married an English teacher. And I was the daughter that, in the, in the next generation, I was the child that had absolutely no talent. Mm -hmm. So I sat in the theatre watching my aunts and uncles and their children and my sister creating all these beautiful things and thought about how I would fill the spaces and, and eventually became a, a writer and a director. And my dad was um, a fairly eclectic... Um, my, well, my, my household was fairly mad. I was, I was thinking uh, Douglas Gautier, and at the, um, a, who runs the Asian Arts Festival yes, in, yes. in Adelaide, was saying to me recently, only your father could find in the 70s a gay Japanese man who trained with, in Russian theatre <laughs> and bring him out to Australia to teach acting in Chinese communist <laughs> ways of creating pieces. So I was always surrounded by very um, interesting people who were pioneers and, and Dad was also the first person in Australia to do Bertolt Brecht, which meant to direct a, a Brecht uh, production of the Thropany Opera and he was greeted with the review in 1959. Ha Cherry has, um, has programmed, in this year he's programmed Tennessee Williams, Bertolt Brecht and Arthur Miller all at the Melbourne Theatre Company. Who's yeah. ever heard of these seven day yeah. wonders? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and can't he find a decent play for us to go and yeah. see? <laughs> I always treasured that review. So yeah. that meant that um, a kind of the world was open and I got to, to see lots of different people and, and um, just kind of fell into directing. And do you have, you know, you hear stories about uh, Lucy and Hilary Bell and John, John uh, uh, Bell and Anna Volska's children kind of crawling around the, uh, uh, the stage of the, the Staples Theatre in Sydney. Do you have a, an early memory or a formative memory of seeing a particular work of your dad's or seeing a particular work in rehearsal? Do you, do you think I totally stick? do. Yeah. I, uh, my dad, from the age of three, my dad would take me to rehearsal, but he was a complete tyrant. So he would say, you can stay here as long as you can keep your mouth shut. <laughs> So I could literally, from the age of three, I could, I was able to be quiet for hours on yeah. end, and uh, that's I think where I developed the yeah. ability to just sit that's in good. a room and watch, and 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 so I watched amazing people like Noni Hazelhurst, and Dad's rule was as long as I didn't bother anyone, I could be there. So I could get if I could make a whole day and no one noticed me. I'd be there for the day. Yeah, and this is back at Russell Street? When uh, Russell Street? This was um, even in Adelaide. Adelaide where yeah. I, yeah, going to the Adelaide Festival and then when Dad ran Flinders. So yes, yep. And then later on I went to... I wanted to study creative writing and directing, so I went to school for both those things. But my early years were definitely being mentored by my father. Yes, yeah. In the old school way. In the old school way. And was there, um, was there a brief 
period of flirtation with an alternative career where we might have lost you to dentistry or oh, marine no, biology never. or something? I oh. thought I, I personally thought I was born to be an actress. But um, when both your husband and your father yes. tell you how bad you are, yes. <laughs> you know that you're not going to get any support that in that regard. So, yeah. uh, but I, I was always destined to sit and, and watch other people be clever, I think. And, and do you have, uh, in terms of seeing, sitting in on rehearsals or seeing early work, do, are there particular productions that stand out in your mind as, as, as formative? Do you remember... A, Things that, that were influential in your in your early career, even as a child. Probably the 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 most in the first production I remember seeing was um, a Romeo and Juliet outside, and I really was about three then, and I loved seeing the swords flashing in yeah. the light, and but I also loved being taken backstage and watching um, how the stage managers brought things to mm. life and how they had these. <laughs> control panels that fascinated me I think it looked to me like a toy set I like to play with um, I love the idea of just being able to make worlds and the first production I remember seeing of Romeo and Juliet someone actually got hurt so I remember fight. being no, yeah no. in a sword fight so I remember thinking you know that's quite amazing that there's life and blood and yes. and light and and um, risk and, and that's, that was quite thrilling. So TV never had the same interest for yes. me, not that same sense of danger. And then going to watch people like Noni Hazelhurst rehearse, she was amazing and yeah. you've worked with her. Yeah. Yeah. Just even young, she just yeah. had such yeah. charisma and, yeah. and intelligence. And I, I think pa once I got past wanting to be Noni, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Or just hang out with Noni, <laughs> who is one of the loveliest people in the universe. <laughs> I guess I I really kind of loved her intelligence, and and Robin Archer was another one. They were both women in in the seventies who who got to go to work and be themselves and transform. But they were I got to watch these amazing women who who saw themselves as equals. And, and and watch my father work with a whole lot of people who saw themselves as equals. So that, to me, was really intriguing and fantastic. And I loved being in that world. Yeah. And is there... Tell me about the first play you ever directed. <laughs> if you <laughs> might <laughs> <not> remember <laughs> it. Yeah. Oh, you, yeah. I'm trying... If I can think back that far. The first play I ever directed was Lysistrata. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And I had... That was fun. But I don't think I had a clue. Yeah. <laughs> I just thought I was clever. I yes, mean, what makes yeah. and how what old? makes anyone decide they're going to be a director? Really, do you know yeah. why you became a director? Ah, uh, it's interesting because I am, um, and I, I won't I won't talk too much because I mentioned to to uh, to uh, okay, but I think for me it was that that chance at being present at something from inception, from the very first idea through to its realization on stage, uh, and I, I loved that. Uh, that process, I think, seeing something through uh, all of the phases, I think, really, I really, I really enjoyed. Uh, and actually, for me, it was about a really formative experience of, of, in fact, a production of Arthur Miller's *The Crucible*, where I saw two things um, when I was at high school, and I saw uh, people I knew transform into other people, and I just thought that was just amazing. Uh, and I saw what a well-told story could do to a room full of people mm. uh, and how that amazing plot uh, and unfolding of story in that, in, that, in that play, how that could affect, change the temperature in um, a room full of people. And I went, I kind of want to be involved in doing that. Uh, but if it was, what, was play number, um, what was play number two? What were some of the early... Uh, well, early they're always pretty political, so yes. statements. And where are we? Where are we now? Are we at? Are we in high school? Are we in high studying? High school are originally, we and then um, once I went to Bard College and UCLA. So Bard was um, a school in upstate New York, where I was working with a lot of people like Joanna Kalaitis. Really, yeah, yeah. the avant-garde of New York was coming up to teach, uh, teach at this particular university, and so. I got to see these incredible painters and writers and artists who were all actually 
sort of breaking things open in the late 80s and the AIDS e epidemic had just started and there was an incredible sense of, of um, creativity having to be attached to the political and the teachers there were really challenging. Um, so I started doing my very political work there and then going to UCLA. Yes, And yep. even being at UCLA was political because I was about the first woman director they'd had there. Really, yeah. One of, um, you know, because theatre, I was training in theatre, film and television and they just didn't have many women at all who'd gone through the program but alone survived it. And I was a shocking crier. I still am quite yeah. likely to cry if anyone's mean to me. So they said, yeah. they said to me at Good the lesson. end, Don't be mean not, to only, not only are you one of the first women we've ever trained, but you're certainly the first one we've had who's cried through the entire three years. <laughs> Good, yes. Yes. So did the and crying then, lesson on year two and three? I just kept, kept, kept. <laughs> but I think at some point they kind of suggested that directors can't cry right. on a regular basis just because they don't get their own way. Yeah. And then I was very relieved to hear... Um, Federer had the same issue when he played tennis. Yes. So I thought, yeah. there's hope yet. <laughs> and at, at um, UCLA, I was taught by um, Oscar Eustace, who commissioned Angels, Angels in America. America. It's part of your, your very lo your long term really association lucky. with uh, yeah. Angels in America, obviously, having just directed it uh, at QUT and having just opened a production of it in Black Swan. But you were present at the inception of it, weren't you? I was indeed. And so the teachers that I had were guys who were being influenced by Carol Churchill, who's my goddess. I just I'll think ask I you, I'll, I'll put a little pin in that because I want to ask you about your, your influences at another point. But yes, sorry. Yeah, okay. so Carol Churchill, I did a lot of Carol Churchill at UCLA. Yep. Um, and, and I think that the issue for me growing up with a very strong, very opinionated father and then being around that bunch of guys who were the next generation of men like my father in terms of being hooked into Brecht and, and uh, Tony Kushner and, and very quite political about all the work they were creating was how did I find my voice in the middle of all of that? And, and so my, I, I was working with some Latino film directors in the, in the film department and it was clear to me that I was never going to be a film director because at UCLA, the guys that I was working with were basically born with cameras in their hands. <laughs> yes. Yep. And they used to come over and say to me, can you tell us how to talk to, to an actors. actor? Yes, yeah, yeah. So I would talk to the actors for them and they would deal with the cameras. And I just thought, I know what my, what, where I should be and I know where they should be and I respect them and they respect me, but we're not the same. And the, I remember a Latino director saying to me, everyone else in this school is interested in form. I don't have time for that. And uh, I, I've got things I need to say about being a Latino and I don't really care what form I use to say it. In the, A gay Latino man, I don't care what form I need. Because you know, the content of the message was so important. So important political to him content politically message, yeah. that he didn't care. And, I, and, and when I what form he used. And I thought, that's really interesting because I suppose I've always been around form and, yes, and yep. engaged with it, but I'm more engaged by what the content is. And so I'm not someone who's going to change the world as a director by bringing in brilliant new form. I appreciate people who can do that and I'll promote them as an artistic director, but always my trajectory has been that I'm more interested in taking in a, an established form and subverting it so or infiltrating it and taking it for my own argument. Um, so, you know, I, I, I like to turn things upside down, see how I can subvert them, change them, look at them, mm. not, not change their form but question why the form is that way. Yes, um, yep. And can I, can I, we'll leap around a bit chronologically, yeah. but... You know, being an artistic director of a state theatre company, uh, as you've done so successfully at Black Swan, um, you know, I imagine there are there are particular parameters that you program within, uh, in terms of reaching the the breadth of audience that you're obliged to reach. Uh, was that an interesting challenge to inject some of that subversion uh, into that quite, some would say, rigid framework? Yes, completely. Okay. And sometimes, but. 
I was really lucky that I had a chair that said, I want you to get audiences. So I was like, okay, you can have your audiences and I can have my subversion. And yes. sometimes I would be amazed by what I would get away with. Um, and, but I, I, it meant that I could take things, I used the form so that it was acceptable, but then I would twist it so that I got my own way as well. So an example of this was I really wanted to do the mother. Am I allowed to swear? I think I think you are. We'll go live, but apart from that, I Is think that it's okay. okay. So I really wanted to do a Queensland. play called The Mother Flower and the Hat, which no one in Australia had done. And I had a, uh, my chairman at the time was Sam Walsh, who was the re head of Rio Tinto Iron Ore, and I knew that it would create a um, difficult situation for him with various audiences, you know. And and so <coughs> I I um, I went to I went to the Wall Street Journal. And I found a um, review that said, despite the stupid name, this is a great play. Right. So I put that in the board papers and I went to every conservative business um, magazine or newspaper that I could find and read them and got all the things that I could line up that would make it appealing to the board. And then we had to advertise it and go on radio. Has my mic come off? No, I think you're, oh, I think still you're good. Working. Yeah. Whoops, now it's come off. Now it's come off. Sorry. I'll talk. I'll talk while you are uh, while you. Um, for those of you who don't know, it's Stephen Aldry. I can never pronounce his surname. Al Gurgis. 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 Um, play uh, that was on Broadway about three or four years ago. Yes. Uh, I think Chris Chris Rock. I think I saw it on Broadway with actually Chris Rock in the in the role and hilarious, but very very uh, provocative. But also a kind of example of uh, probably a diversity of of casting that you don't generally see on Australian stages with. You know, African American actors, Puerto Rican actors, um, and but but um, as well as that, it's it's just a kind of rip roaring, very very funny it's a night great in play. the theatre. Yeah. So uh, in the end, I I got it passed everyone by us saying, you know, we're doing this play, the Mother F, and we had to have stars. Stars, yeah. And um, and then last year when it was going to the West End, my chair happened to be in London. And, and someone said to him, oh, I'm going to see this play, The Mother F. And he said very proudly, oh, The Mother F in the Hat. Yeah, we did that three years ago at, yeah. at Black Swan. So you basically have to kind of earn trust to get across the things that, that you want to do. And then doing things like Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, which was a huge... People kept on saying, why don't you do it with women? That'll be a really political comment. But I, I actually thought to do Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross with the way I saw those men and how critical I wanted to be of them um, was much more political for me than to um, subvert the casting in yeah. any way. So I, I always have two or three things in a season that are either subverting my own work, subverting the form we're exploring or making some kind of political statement. Yes, and are there... Uh to go, let's, let me jump. Let me jump back again to you. To you, um, as a as a director of theatre, are there? What do you think makes a good director of theatre? I'm so old fashioned. <laughs> Listening. <no. laughs> I think talking, being being someone who's interested in bridge building, but I also um, love that Russian model of directing, where you're not even allowed to say you're a director until you're 30 years old because um, they believe you should have to study music and, and art and have a sense of all the different elements that are attached to the art form. That, that being a director isn't about um, kind of claiming an authority but earning it, yep. I guess. And so do, you, do you agree with that proposition? I mean? For myself, yes. For other people, I don't necessarily think that's what they should do, but certainly that's how I went about it. And I, I'm i most interested in directing as a unifying force, of bringing people together who believe in the same thing and, who, and finding a unity of form. So my closest collaborator for many years was a man called Rory Dempster, a beautiful lighting designer. And he once said to me, I hate it when anyone says to me, I didn't like the show, but I loved the lighting design. He said, that's so offensive. 
He goes, if I was any good on the show, if they hated the show, they should also hate the lighting design. Yeah. Um, and I'm probably least interested in doing work where you've got a whole lot of people who are going in as individuals and, and proclaiming their individualism. So a few weeks ago I was at Bangara's latest thing and saw just the most incredible work and I thought, why is this work continuously so powerful to me? And I think it's because there's a unity and a beauty to the unity, but it isn't um, what I would consider a fascist form of unity. There are also differences in all the movements and, and within that beautiful unified structure, there's the celebration of, of different bodies and colours and shapes and psychologies of space. So that's the work that I think is mm -hmm. just perfection. And um, this, might be a, this might be a slightly tricky question but speaking of work that you think of as perfection are there um probably like asking a parent to name their favorite child do you do you have particular shows that you've made that stand out as favorites or yes. that you're especially proud of um, with do. respect to anyone who's not included in that list who's been involved in one of those shows that Kate's created but what yeah what what stands out in your memory well the that probably the um the first is life after george yes yep. um which, Which you did the world premiere of. Yes, 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 and then went round to various festivals, including the Brisbane Festival. And But what was so amazing about Life After George was that it was a play about Melbourne that we did in Melbourne, opening at the beginning of the new millennium. And it, it was political, it was about um, fees being charged at universities and how much... Hanny Rayson and I didn't agree with this. You can see what a powerful impact our play had on the, yeah. <laughs> on the as you shell out your um, university fees. But <laughs> we were all really passionate um, about free education and we all had a story we wanted to tell. And it was about three different generations of women who'd all been in love with the same man. And on opening night, um, everyone stood up, which is always lovely. But it, I, it, it wasn't that it was the best thing I've ever directed by far or that the performances were the best. It was that there was a moment by the end of the evening where we had achieved unity and, and uh, it transcended somehow the storytelling, the fact that we'd done the set on a very minimal budget, that it, at one point um, there were so many props and, and, and things that were in the um, play that we worked on it for a year and in the end what we came down to was we would have one window, one, del one door, one ladder, one table, one chair and that was it. And, and the, each thing became transformative. And we went on this journey and the audience came with us. And that was amazing. It was absolutely astonishing to have that sense of unity and that everybody went with the idea together. All My Sons was yes, pretty profoundly yeah, yeah, moving yeah. at Melbourne Theatre Company. Yeah. And, and, one of, and the reason that is one of my favourite productions is that on opening night, where you usually expect 80%, the actors kept coming in and everything that they did was better than I'd seen in the rehearsal room. And it started with one actor and then the next actor came on stage and, and it got to the point where I was thinking, oh my God, we're actually better in front of an audience than we were in our, in our nice little yes, safe yeah. space. And, and they grew and grew and transcended the work we'd done. And again, and I'd, I'd had just had Orlando and it was just this amazing feeling of at one with the universe. So yeah. they're probably two of the most powerful productions for me. And what about if we cast the net slightly wider and we talk about productions of other people that you've been particularly influenced by or remember? What, what stands out there? Well, definitely a lot of my father's productions, of course. Um, I was incredibly influenced by watching Angels come to life. 
Yes. Yep. Because we were being given the script. And I think that that might be the... Um, it was really interesting hear you, hearing you talk about your how you came to directing because I think the thing for me was I love reading but I never wanted to be a person that was in a room alone. So I didn't want to be a book editor or a writer. Mm. So for me it's always about where you start with the script and where you end up with other people. Yeah. And being with other people is actually probably the harder part for me. It's easy for me to be a ro alone in a room reading. I love that bit and I know where I'm heading. So I, I always find the most interesting and rewarding work is when I'm involved from the beginning. So Angels was incredible because we were reading some of the best work I've ever seen. Yes. And, and Oscar <coughs> and Tony were putting red pens through it all the time, just going, not good enough, not good enough. And you're like, this is the best writing I've ever seen and we're leaving it on the floor. Yeah. Um, so that was a huge influence. Going to Shakespeare and Company, which I think some of you would know of through Diane Eden, was, am was amazing because of the culture of seeking truth no matter what. Um, the first time I saw the Dragons trilogy was yes, Lepage, Robert yeah. Lepage's work was just phenomenal. And then ne a lot of Neil's work is revelatory. Yes, yep. Uh, probably I like it for different reasons, like up the road, because he's so good at, at reducing things when they're sm smaller. I love yes, his yep. distillations. Yep. Um, a lot of... I've had a lot of different influences and... And uh, the last one, last week, we're seeing Ca Black Swan's Caucasian Chalk Circle, which was done by a Chinese director with Chinese designers. And that has been quite a, an interesting and tricky journey for Black Swan to go on because we, um, we had a multicultural cast. We had um, uh, Kylie Farmer, who's Indigenous and Chinese. So I think of her as the heart of the project. And we had um, my husband, who's African American, and white actors, and actors of many different traditions, all in the same room. And the the Chinese director would give an instruction, and the American would say why. <laughs> <laughs> and the the Australians all had yeah. their different expectations, yes, and yeah. they had to figure out how to talk to each other. And not just say, because I said so, or I'm not going to do that unless you give me a good reason. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. And then on opening night to go and see it and to, to see that all these different people had come together to form a company and, and had created something amazing together. So I think I like, I, I tend to like work where I like the process as much as, yes, the, yeah, the, as the outcome. Yeah. yeah. Well, process might be a neat segue, or process might be a neat segue into uh, your next role. Uh, and for those of you who may or may not know, Kate, uh, in the various companies in which she's worked, has, uh, I don't know if I can safely say this, been at, been at the forefront of how uh, arts companies and theatre companies nurture the next generation of talent. Uh, we had an, an experience when I was at the Melbourne Theatre Company uh, in my previous role where we were looking through the... Uh, we were contemplating doing a women, a women directors scheme uh, and then it was brought to our attention... Uh, a, an annual report from sort of a decade ago uh, where Kate's Women Directors Scheme was, was set <laughs> out, uh, which was not dissimilar to what uh, the MTC was about to do and claim that it was very groundbreaking. <laughs> uh, but that's, that's a roundabout way of, of uh, talking about uh, that part of your practice, Kate, that, that's been not just about seeing a main stage theatre company as the, as the programming of a suite of plays, uh, but also about how, the, how do you acknowledge a state theatre company's responsibility to, to its industry uh, and to the next generation of talent, uh, which is a neat link into your new role uh, at NIDA. Do you, do you want to talk a little bit about, about that challenge of, of, of nurturing the next generation of talent and, and how you might take that interest into, into your new role as, as head of NIDA? Well, I think it, it all go, it's all of a piece, I'm sure you'd agree on this, that audiences, if you don't um, diversify um, the practice and the people who are engaged in the practice, you're not going to diversify audiences. So Caucasian chalk circle, ma marketing managers can talk till they're blue in the face, but unless you've got people of many different 
shapes, colours, sizes, ages, interests, inclinations on the stage together, you are not going to get mixed audiences. And, and Black Swan is proof of that. At uh, Caucasian Chalk Circle, had more Chinese faces in the audience than I've ever seen before because there were Chinese people involved in creating the production. Same with the indigenous audiences and young audiences. I mean, we can gauge what our audience is going to be like looking at how they feel included by the people that we're putting on stage. That's why I've always been committed to state theatre companies because I believed, and I don't always believe that we live up to what we attempt to do, but I believe that, that state theatre companies have to be places where um, you privilege many different kinds and colours of people. So the, I think it's a political statement if, the, um, if Black Swan does Indigenous work and that work goes on the main stage. I think it's another statement when you put um, the emerging artists in the basement, I call it. So one of the things we did um, at Black Swan was that I would never just have emerging, emerging artists said to me, look, Kate, we can do our work in the basement by ourselves. We actually want collaborations. So our emerging artists work has always been about engaging the emerging artists with main stage actors so that the main stage actors can learn newer practices and, and be questioned and the emerging artists get the chance to engage with what the main stage actors have been doing. I was just reading an article about Sam French again, uh, Sam Walsh, um, uh, talking about Rio and that Rio Tinto Mining has a, a, a department devoted to the future. And he was saying in this article, you know, how you can limit the future by saying we've got a department that takes care of that, you know, because how can you know in 10 years what systems you'll need? And it, 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 you, um, people constantly need to reevaluate their systems depending on what what the core work is. So at Black Swan, we were trying to... We didn't have a big um, infrastructure to begin with, but what we were trying to do was to create situations where there's enough space for the emerging artists, new practices, different practices, to come in and push the company around and change us and shape us so that when new and interesting ways of devising work enters the room, we're ready for it. But it's quite hard to know how to prepare in a way. So this is one of the things I'm really keen about taking on at NIDA. How does NIDA get ready to fulfil what you, Sam Strong, are looking for um, as a leader of a state company, but then also pave the way for the next generation of artists who may have nothing to nothing, who may not want anything to do with the kind of practice Queensland Theatre yeah. Company is is following at the moment. And how do we have that? conversation, it's a really um, quite difficult conversation to even work out how we engage with it. And I think it, I, th I, I entirely agree and I, and I think what I uh, feel is exciting about the future of the arts in Australia is that while we have been in a period of, of not an enormous amount of cooperation or collaboration, uh, I feel that we're actually on the cusp of uh, a new era of cooperation in the arts um, across various platforms, across art forms, across cities, uh, between training institutions and state theatre companies, for example, uh, training institutions like NIDA or QUT and companies like QTC. Uh, and I think that's a very exciting possibility into the future. Do you want to give us... We will throw open to the, f to the floor in a minute. Uh, but do you want to tell us your thoughts on what's the state of... What do you think the state of... A, the very small question, Kate, uh, <laughs> of what, what do you think... What is the state of Australian culture at the moment? What are the challenges that we face? What are the... What are the possibilities? Are you optimistic? Are you, are you I'm pessimistic? I'm always optimistic. Yeah. I'm always optimistic about it's creativity. It's good. Like, it's like theatre director 101. Too. <laughs> All theatre directors are by, by, by constitution, optimis, <laughs> optimists. 
<laughs> Just because we do yeah, the work. Yeah, keep going. <laughs> um, I, I think there are various challenges to be faced, but being an old-fashioned uh, Marxist from way back, I dissect everything through money, of course. We, or any Marxist knows the value <coughs> of money. And so I, I, as we're looking at this idea of um, how to get how to break down barriers for women and, um, and, and other cultures. I, I think the big challenge for institutions and for state theatre companies is that I think more and more we'll probably move towards quotas. And so I'm quite concerned about this idea of 50% of the shows have to be, say, directed by women and 50% directed by men or whatever. Because I think that what often happens is that, yeah, the women get 50% of the shows, but they do not get 50% of the money. So I actually want to start a conversation at NIDA where we go, oh, yes, we want to see 50% um, or we want to see a diversity, but we actually want to know how we can track where the money supply is going in all of this. Because it's, if it's 50% of women, but 100% of them are in the basement doing the shows, and the boys are <coughs> getting... Excuse me. So. No, 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 no. No, <laughs> Sorry. no, 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 no that, that wasn't a time to cough. Wasn't it? Yeah. And yeah. the boys are getting yeah. the majority of the money to do their fabulous main stage productions that they do brilliantly. We're not actually changing anything. So, of course, I'm looking at how do we subvert that so that um, the next Andrea Moore that comes up at 25 is given the same amount of money as the next Sam Strong. Um, how do we make people trust... How do we, how do we empower people to trust the other so that we're not in a situation, and, and I know you would know I feel quite strongly about this, where nearly all of the majors are run by men. In fact, at one point, um, Lindy Hume and I were sitting in a cafe and someone came into the cafe and said, if we bombed this cafe right now, <laughs> there would be no women running major arts organisations in this yeah. country. <laughs> so it's, there's clearly something that's, that's not working because we've been talking about this now for 25 years and apologising and discussing. And, and so I, I see NIDA as a place where I can go and start having these conversations with people like Sam and we can literally get down to the nitty-gritty of how we change things. Because you do raise an interesting point, don't you, in the sense that those you know, questions of equity of representation have been kind of at the forefront of Australian theatre in the last decade, but as you point out, for a lot longer than that. Uh, and that notwithstanding the prominence of those questions, uh, we haven't actually seen as much change... As we would as have... We, as we would have liked. Wished. Yeah. yeah. I think that's absolutely true. Well, we might throw, um, on that slightly less than cheery note, um, we might throw open to some questions from the floor. I can keep talking to Kate all night, but I imagine you guys might have some, some questions. Yes. Yes. Right, yeah. Hello, Kirsten. Hi, Kirsten. How are you, Sam? Yeah. Nice to see you. Hello. Nice yeah. to see you, yeah. Um, Kay, could you reflect on um, your experience of being an, a CEO and an artistic director and the situations where that's created a real challenge for you to resolve and how you resolved it? Well, I've never been just the CEO before. So uh, at um, Black Swan, it was joint. It was a joint position, which I think is a good model. But at NIDA, when they offered me the CEO and um, director position, I decided to take it because I thought that um, Australian directors and artists are, being, um, being, are becoming secondary to ideas of management and that at places like NIDA, it's about leadership, not management. And I believe very strongly uh, that management... In, that any management structure that's created needs to support the core business. And I, I certainly have felt over the last decade that I've watched management um, often 
uh, believe that it is the primary driver of artistic organisations. And I, I, I really believe, like it's my religion, that it's the philosophy and the vision of a company that should be the primary driver um, and the audience. The audience has to care about what you're doing or, or who cares. And then um, that, the, that the management system and the arts leadership have to find ways of, of working together. But I'm quite, um, I, I think that um, there's a moral imperative to being a cultural leader in any country and to ignore the moral imperative because of certain man management requirements um, makes us smaller as artists. So. Uh, that, I don't know if that answers your question, but I look forward to many arguments with myself in yeah. the years to come. Yeah. <laughs> and can I can I just elaborate on, on the question as well? Do you do you find how did you find that exercise of shifting from the way you operate in a rehearsal room to the way you operate in a in a broader company? And you know, they're they're very different rhythms of decision making, or they're very different scales of involvement of people. Did you find that a that a natural and an easy transition? No, or not yeah. at all. Yeah. I didn't find it easy at all. I, I, um, I think, I don't know how you find this, but in a rehearsal room, there's an honesty to a rehearsal room that is really interesting. You've got six weeks and then you can all read about yourselves in the newspaper and it's amazing how much politics that takes care of. You know, everyone's going to show up, work hard and we're all in it together. And um, and so I think that I am. I'm uh, uh, the the hardest thing for me as a theatre director was to learn. As a theatre director, you go in, you've got five or six weeks to get people from A to B, and you'll do practically anything in order to achieve that. And you're used to working in short, sharp yeah. bursts. And managers in theatre companies are working in a v in very yeah. long term. And um, they they are working different kinds of hours, and there's a whole lot of other things that come into play, and that should be greeted as patiently as yes. I greet artists. But yes. I tend to be yeah. le less and less patient. So in the rehearsal room, I try to be very patient. In the office, I really have to work on patience. And by the time I get home to my 11-year-old, I have no patience whatsoever. Yeah. So I tend to say to him, take the note, you've been given it, yeah. get in the bar. Yeah. <laughs> nice, nice, very nice indeed. Um, do you have any, any more questions from the, uh, from the floor? Yes. Hello, Joe. Kate, hi, my name is Jo. Hi, I'm Joy. actually in the cultural leadership cohort at NIDA. Oh, fantastic. So I look forward to working with you. I just want to draw you a bit more on this question about management and leadership um, because I think it's a great idea, but I feel like the system is broken. So I want to draw you a bit more about how we actually do that. What do, which system? I guess I'm looking a lot at kind of the economic models that arts organisations are being encouraged towards and um, that as managers of arts organisations, we're being encouraged in to speak in that language as well. So how do we as artists and as leaders continue to push a different um, cultural and, as you say, moral agenda? Good question. I know it's, it's a hard. really yeah. good question. I, I think Sam's probably <laughs> the better, but he's the, you're the more systematic yeah. mind. I don't know. Not not. Um, uh, I'm not sure about that. I mean, to, I, I, I'll, you should, I, I'll go you briefly. Go just first. give you some time to order your, <laughs> to order your thoughts. That's just because that's the so kind of Joe, Joe is actually interested. I think in what you think. <laughs> yeah, you so I'll be. I'll right. get out of the way. But give you some time. Um, I think really great arts organisations, uh, whatever sort of of art they they make, are actually unified towards one end, uh, and that yes. can be a challenge because different stakeholders, to use the terminology, uh, can require different things of you. But I think in a really highly functioning, successful arts organisations, those kind of, of uh, challenges of terminology, challenges of kind of unity of vision are actually taken care of uh, and, and can be cut through. 
that's my short answer to the question that you're much more interested in hearing from Kate on. <laughs> um, so I, I wonder what you mean starting with the systems are broken. Do, are you feeling, are you talking about the fact that there's an economic kind of, the economic rationalism that's infiltrating? Yeah, well, I, I feel quite, <laughs> I feel quite passionately about this. I, I feel, I, when I went to Black Swan, Black Swan was not in a good state and they were looking at merging us with another company. And I went and met, I mean, I'm the kind of person that didn't even talk to a Liberal till I was 35. So <laughs> I don't have, um, I'm not very skilled in that kind of language. So to me, it's like I started learning French and German when I was, um, and I still haven't really learned management for management's sake. But I talked to a man, a brilliant man, who worked at Price Waterhouse and talked, he talked to me about mergers. And he said, you can't possibly merge with another company right now because Black Swan is not strong enough. You will be subsumed. And that intrigued me because I, I had always had that political kind of question how does a state theatre company work with a smaller company and not subsume the smaller company? And how do we have systems that engage with others and not turn them into, um, turn their practices upside down so they can fit into our systems? So I kind of made this my mantra. First of all, Black Swan had to be strong enough for, a, for us to work with other people. We had to know who we were and what we cared about before we could engage with anyone else, whether that was about sharing resources, sharing money, sharing names, collaborating. We were, in my mind, too risky a proposition to enter in together. And now I feel that we are strong, but I've watched us enter into a series of relationships with businesses, and I have reached the conclusion that when Business people come onto a board, that is fantastic, good on them. But they have to recognise when they come onto a board that a board is a custodian of a culture, whatever that culture is, and that coming onto a board with your business practice and enforcing your business practice on an arts organisation is not good enough. I remember hearing about... Um, someone who's just gone onto a board in England of a major arts organisation. And this is a very prominent business person who had to do four interviews to get onto the board. And I thought, that is our issue. We are so used to a certain kind of way of our arts organisations being supported. And now government funding is drying up. We're entering into relationships with businesses but we don't want the business people who come on the board to feel that they know everything. We want them to, rec the great business people who go on to boards recognise that we are custodians of our culture and, and we are custodians of the ent identity of the company that is representing the culture in some way. And if they are coming onto the board, they are, they are doing so um, with privilege and they should also do so with respect. So yes, arts organisations are having to enter into a whole lot of collaborations that we never anticipated would be our fate, but it is our fate. And I actually think in this new global, this world that's changing so fast, artists are better off because we know how to collaborate. We have emotional <coughs> intelligence. We know how to run strong negotiations. We exist no matter what. And um, we have to value ourselves and we have to sadly be prepared for battles that we may lose. We have to be so confident and strong in ourselves that we are willing to take risks for because we believe in something about our arts organisation or a piece of art or a piece of theatre 
and you have to know what you will go to the wall over. And once, once it's easy to say it and it's really hard to give up the job that gives you the salary to send your kid to a school and pay your mortgage or your rent. But if we let ourselves be um, ridden over, just driven over, we um, stand for nothing and then we're meaningless and then there's no point in subsidising us. Does that answer your question at all? Yeah, it was a good Great start. Answer. Thank you. Thank you. And, um, any more questions? And the answers will come from people like you doing the cultural leadership program. They won't come from old people like me. We've got time for we've got time for possibly one more. Yes, Kate. Hi, Kate. Uh, my name's Kate. Too. Hi, Kate. Uh, um, there's obviously there's always a lot of talk about um, state theatre companies and their role in supporting emerging and independent artists yes. and small to medium companies. You touched on it, but. Um, it'd be great to hear a little bit more from you of things that you saw that really worked, things that didn't, <coughs> some of the challenges in that or some of the things that, that you think are not just the state theatre companies but, um, you know, that both uh, independent and small to medium and state theatre companies could be doing better. So, together? Yeah, the, the, the connection between the two, the um, ways that you saw Black Swan be able to support emerging and, and small to medium companies in a really good, sustainable, you know, um, way and times when you saw that it didn't, it didn't work? Well, I think we're at our best when we are able to provide support and, um, and places where there are conversation, actually. I think the thing, probably the thing I feel proudest about at Black Swan is that we've moved from from being a place where a certain number <coughs> of people came to being a meeting place where the independent sector comes and discusses the work. And we go to see their work and our board goes to... I think partly it's because there's been this massive geographical shift at Black Swan where we are now in a space where we're next to the Blue Room, which is great independent um, theatre makers and Pika, which has a gallery and the state theatre company and we're all mixed in and that has meant that there are various places where we meet and act as colleagues and discuss things. The other thing that's been a huge influence in WA is that we've set up a, um, a um, program called the Chamber of Culture and the Arts which was set up by my chair at the time, Sam Walsh. And he set it up because he felt that there were so many different voices in the arts sector that it was easy for government to dismiss us as rabbles, as ununified rabbles. And so here's the head of Rio Tinto saying, I don't see them as ununified rabble, um, feral theatre makers. I see them as, as a group of people who have a lot of things to say at, but also need the chance to be reactive quickly. So when the Arts Council cuts came through, when Osco was cut, what was <coughs> intriguing to me was that Queensland was the place that knew how to react fast. The small to medium sector in Queensland seemed to me to be the people who were feeding to us what needed to happen and how we would go about it. And I think that probably comes back to the Joe B. Joe Peterson days. But the um, analytical work that was coming to us in WA and the, the driven um, demands that I at Black Swan stand up and get myself to a rally, they came out of Queensland originally. The fact that Western Australia reacted fast and incisively and, and did so because we believed in the arts, not in particular organisations, was because of the chamber. And this meant that major players from both sides of government and business, so Liberals, Labor, Greens, business, independent artists, myself, we were unified as one voice going out to Western Australia and saying we passionately believe as artists we are an ecosystem and we cannot survive without each other. 
which doesn't necessarily mean that I'm going to be the person that sits in the blue room and watches the most esoteric piece of work. Um, it means that I'm going to go, I'm willing to fight for that esoteric piece of work to exist and see it as, as important to its audience as my more mainstream work would be to some of my audience. So that to me is probably the greatest accomplishment of being able to have emerging writers, resident artists, emerging artists, all in the same place all being able to argue with each other, say, I don't like your work, but yes, I like this part of it. Um, and having us as one voice rise up and say, we are two, we, are, we cannot take any more cuts. We all depend on each other. That was the most important thing to me. And the thing that I think is most damaging in the Australian theatre right now is what I think of as a kind of fundamentalism that I've watched take hold over the last 10 years. I'm an independent artist. I make state theatre work. I do this. I do that. I'm funded by this. I'm funded by that. And I just go, what the hell is happening? We are all artists. And sometimes only one person wants to see my work. And sometimes I want to go into a tiny space and sometimes I want to go into a big space. And what made New York great when I was there was that I would hear an, an independent artist like Eric Bogosian talking about a Broadway show he'd been to and I would understand the Broadway show better because I'd heard him talk about it. And then I'd hear a main stage actress like Cherry Jones talking about going downtown and seeing something at the public and analysing the avant-garde work and doing it brilliantly. And I think we are missing out in Australia if we believe you have to be an independent artist, you have to be a main stage artist, you have to be this kind of artist. And instead of looking at each other's work with love and respect and analysing it, I, I, I only get better if I hear from many different kinds of people. I don't want to be told someone does or doesn't like my work because it's on a big stage or because they don't think I'm an auteur. That's of no use to me. That's boring. That's like saying I don't, I don't like someone because of the colour of their skin or the life they've chosen or whatever it is. I want people to look at my work and tell me what they think is good about it and what is bad about it and help me to understand how they've arrived at those conclusions. And I want us as a country to be talking about why an independent artist is doing great work and not have it matter that they have no money in the moment. You're just looking at the great work and there's incredible work I see done for next to nothing. And then have a main stage artist have their work examined on the same with the same questions and the same look at process. And I think until we meet each other with respect and generosity and analysis, we won't ever kind of give each other the credit to become the great artistic capital that we are. No, I think that's a um, it's both very well said and a fabulous note. Uh, to end on, where we can we can continue to meet with respect and generosity upstairs, as I understand it, um, for some drinks. But please, uh, join me. thank you for your questions, uh, firstly, and thank you for joining us tonight. But uh, most importantly of all, of course, please join me in thanking Kate Cherry. Thank you.